Now we're going to get into mixing our song, and I'm going to use the same song I've been using throughout the synthesis lectures. You can see that we've got the lead, accompaniment parts, bass, and then kick, snare, hi-hat, and crash, and these have all been synthesized. And then we also have some risers down here, and then the main output. Just a quick refresher on the song. Made some tweaks to the synthesis. And the melody. You can see my chords up here. I put the chords in as markers. Okay, the first thing we want to do when we're mixing is get our tracks organized. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to shift click across the instrumental tracks. I'm going to right click on them and there is a feature in Logic called Create Track Stack. Now I know Ableton Live has something similar. Most applications will. And some of them you have to route these out a bus. And I'll show you that in a second. Right now I'm just going to create this track stack, summing stack. And you'll see that these four tracks now are kind of under this one called Sum. I'm going to go ahead and call that Instruments. Then I'm going to do the same thing for the drums. So I'm going to right click here, create track stack, and I'm going to call that one drums. And it really quickly allows me to collapse down my session. You see that? I can click these little arrows here. And I'm going to do one more on these two, and I'm going to call it effects. So as I go back to my mix window now, I can collapse these down here as well. And you'll see that now I've only got three different buses that I'm looking at, or three collections of tracks. If you're using an application where you can't create those quick track stacks, you have to use the more traditional model, which is to use buses. The way to do that is I would select multiple tracks, let's say the instrument tracks are here, and instead of going to the main output, I would go to a bus, and let's go to bus 1 right here, and you'll see now that these three tracks go to bus 1, and bus 1 comes back here in this aux strip. We'll talk about that more in the future, but this aux strip now is all the instruments, and if I hit play... And I mute there, you can you see that I can I've collected all the signal from the instruments going through this track here. So I'm gonna do the same thing with the drums. I'm gonna send them to bus two, and then I'll take the risers and I'll send them to bus. And I'll call that effects. Now I can solo the drums, solo the instruments, or I could solo the, the effects there. The result is the same. And when you do those track stacks, really it's the exact same thing. It's creating the buses automatically for you so you don't have to. So depending on what software you're using, you may have to create your own auxiliary tracks like this. But what I'd like to see in your sessions is that you have your instruments running through a bus and your drums running through a bus and your effects running through a bus. So I'm going to go back to using the track stacks in Logic because I think it's really nice to be able to click these arrows and collapse them. And I'm going to color them so I can see them. And I often will put mine in capital letters so they really pop out to me and I can see my buses. The next step I would recommend is coming across all of your tracks. And you can, you can drag across all the tracks here and adding an equalizer to it. I did that by dragging across all the tracks and just double clicking right here. It puts an EQ on it. Now, I'm going to encourage you to use as little equalization as possible. The main reason I want to install an equalizer on each track is twofold. One, I want to be able to see the analyzer, the frequency analyzer, which shows me the responses across every track, every bus, and, and the master. And then also, I'm often going to want to make use of filters. Okay? We'll be using a very little EQ in our mixes here, but we will be using filters for effects. In Logic, you have to activate the filter there. But now I'm pretty ready to start actually mixing. I've got my buses set up. I've got a frequency analyzer and a, the ability to filter using the EQ plugin on each track right here. The next step is to set some initial levels, and I'm going to recommend that you always start with the drums. And what you want to do is get an initial level where the drums are going to be coming right up to zero decibels when they're playing. So let's just take a look at that. These are the basic the drums right here. And I can see right now it's coming to negative 2.8. Now, I'm pretty happy actually with that that relationship between the kick and the snare and the hi-hat right now. So I can drag across all these and I'm going to bring them up until I see my drum bus getting to zero. You see there it's at negative 0.5. So that's probably pretty good right there. I'm pretty happy with that. 
There we go. So the loudest part of my song is very close to zero. It's at negative 0.5 right now. If I've set the drums to that level, I've got a, I'm going to have a very good level going out to my master bus. What will usually happen is when I add everything else in, it'll be about three decibels over zero on my master bus, and then I'll put a limiter on it, and we want to have about three decibels of reduction in the end. Now I'm going to come over to my instrument track. So I'm going to leave my drum soloed, and I'm going to now bring in the lead, and I'm going to try to match the level of the lead with the snare so that those two sound about the same level. Maybe somewhere right in there. Then I'm gonna bring in the bass. Now the bass, I'm gonna to try to bring it so it's quieter than the kick. I wanna hear the kick, and it was almost like the bass and the kick are the same instrument. Let's see if we can do that. So I'm gonna bring it down, and then I'm gonna slowly bring the level up. I'm listening to the kick and the bass at the same time. One of the biggest problems beginning mixers usually have is they mix the bass way too loud. Music is getting much more bass heavy recently, but it's still surprising how much of that bass is the kick and the sustain is held by the bass and our ear will kind of glue those two sounds together. We want to have the impact of that kick so that there is some dynamic range and the sustain is in the bass, but it's amazing how low the sustain level can be and your brain still thinks it's really loud because the kick was loud. So again, make sure your bass is not louder than your kick. Now, when I bring in the accompaniment, I want it to be behind the lead. One rule of thumb in the accompaniment is make it as quiet as it can be and still hear it. Then I'm gonna bring in the pad. Set the drums to zero. Bring your lead in so it matches the level of the snare since they have a lot of mid-range energy. Bring the bass up until it's just behind the kick and then bring the accompaniment parts up so that they are behind everything. Don't make your bass too loud and don't make your accompaniment too loud. Risers and effects, one of the things I've noticed is people tend to mix them too loud. So when you get to points of your song, I think I have, I have, I have some right here we'll listen to. Make sure that you aren't mixing those too loud. So I might bring those down just a little bit there. Okay, and I can either bring all the effects down or I can bring each channel down like that. So so watch effects that they don't get too loud or one-time shots. Once we've established our basic levels, it's time to start thinking about frequency, the other major component of sound. And this is the main challenge in mixing is managing the relationship between the different frequencies. Now, unlike the past, when music was composed by one person, perhaps recorded and performed by another group of people and then mixed by a different person, you're gonna be doing all, all components at the same time as you work in a DAW. So you will have control over the notes, you will have control of the instruments in the form of synthesizers, and you will have control over the mix in terms of the plugins you use. So you have a lot more power at your disposal than we had in the past. And rather than trying to fix it in the mix, you should be spending a lot of your time mixing by thinking of your arrangement and thinking of your synthesized sounds before you start reaching for equalizers and compressors and those sort of tools. To take a look at frequency, response. Let's look at a couple reference tracks that I've put in here. And uh, one is just a Calvin Harris song. I happen to think Calvin Harris. Okay, so if I play this Rihanna song, you can see the way the frequency analyzer is responding to the song. And you'll notice that the low frequencies have a higher amplitude in them. They're louder than the high frequencies. And that's because our ears are more sensitive to high frequencies. If it was perfectly flat, it would sound like white noise, which sounds very bright to us. We want something that sounds more natural to the human ear as it goes up. And so the sounds get quieter logarithmically as they go up. Pretty much every doubling of the frequency, you want to have about half of the amplitude. It's a good time for you to pop in some of the songs that you like to listen to and take a look at their frequency response. You should see something similar from about 50 to 60 hertz dropping down to about 10,000 hertz at the end. Now, Calvin Harris has a lot of bright information up here at 16,000. I know I'm at the age where I can't even hear it. But it is a little bright on the top here. 
An interesting reference for that is that the saw wave, which I've queued up here as well, a saw wave has a similar frequency response. So if I if I play this, you'll see that that saw wave drops off at about the same rate that most of the music we listen to. And that rate is, like I said, every doubling of the frequency has about half of the amplitude. So it's about three decibels less as you move up across the spectrum. So those are two kind of references you can use. You can have your own track that you are familiar with. And uh, I, I would suggest maybe throwing a saw wave in there and having that up on the channel EQ. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to mute those. I don't hear them, but I can see them, right? I can see that Rihanna track playing in the background, and I've labeled that track reference, so I can always go back and take a quick look at it. So let's go over to our tracks and take a quick look here. And I'm going to go ahead and uh, mute the drums. And we're just going to compare our track to the Rihanna track. And you see that overall we've got the same kind of uh, fall off happening that's pretty good. And that was just by setting our initial levels. And our initial levels are in some ways equalizing because we are picking bass accompaniment and lead sounds and we're balancing them in that way that sounds natural to the human ear, which will have that natural fall off. But as we play as you can see that there's a couple issues that you might be able to hear and or see in this. One of the first is you see a big gap right here. You see that gap there? We also have a lot of really bright information in the accompaniment part. Now, you're seeing some bright information in the Calvin Harris song, but that's mainly when the snare and the hi-hat are hitting. Our song is very bright up here. We've also got some gaps here, and we're a little low in this area. So we want to try to fix those issues. It's okay to have gaps in your song, but if what will happen is if it's played on a stereo system that, say, doesn't play 60 to 80 hertz, the lowest frequencies in your song are going to be up here at 200 to 300 hertz. There won't be any mid to low bass range in here. So a lot of times having kind of a smooth drop off and a consistent equalization across the spectrum is going to help your mix translate to other systems. Let's go over here and take a quick look at our track and we can see our notes that are being played. And correspondingly, we can see a hole right between our bass and our accompaniment. Our bass track is in the appropriate range. It's right around C1, but if you look, our accompaniment and our lead are a little high. Usually you want your accompaniment to be centered around C3, and we're between C3 and C4, and our lead is getting up to C5. Now, that's part of the reason we have so much high information over here is that lead is so high. That's actually an issue I'm going to address. And then I also want to address this gap right here. You can see it in our composition, and you can see it in our EQ response in our song here. It would be silly for me to start reaching for an equalizer and boosting these frequencies, right? Doing this makes no sense. And you can hear it sounds muddied and muffled, okay? We're pulling frequencies that don't have the fundamental frequency right there. We're trying to pull odd overtones or sub-frequencies from the other instruments. For me, it's just a horrible sound. I, I really can't stand the sound of over-equalized instruments. Simultaneously, we might have tried to reduce the bass, right? And those frequencies. And we, we still end up with that strange, hollow, twisted, it's the phase alignment gets off. That's what I hear. Uh, we'll get into that more in more advanced classes. But rather than reaching for this EQ and making it look like Picasso work of art, and this is one of your telltale signs, if you see your equalizer looking like this, you've got arrangement problem. Let's go back and look at the arrangement and see if we can't fix this before it even hits this equalizer. To fix that gap there around 100 to 300 hertz, I have three basic options. One, I can synthesize the bass and add overtones. Two, I can resynthesize the accompaniment and add a sub frequency to it. Or three is I can change the actual notes themselves. Let me show you first what putting some overtones on the bass would look like. My bass patch has most of its energy centered around 60 to 100 hertz, which is right where you want it. It's a very good range to be in. But you'll see that because it's a triangle wave that most of its energy is located simply around that. And you can see the one uh, second harmonic up there around 200, I think. Let's see. Yep, somewhere in there. But we know we, we can see in our bass the hole right there. Let's patch that hole by simply synthesizing a new frequency on top of it. I have a, another oscillator here, three, which I'll turn on. I'm going to give it a square wave. I could give it a sine wave if I wanted, but uh, I'm going to do square. And instead of playing it at the same pitch, I'm going to move it up an octave here. Okay, and then I can mix and have more of that third oscillator 
fact, I can have all third oscillator or about half and half. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to drag this slowly down. And as I drag it, you should see a second frequency emerge out and come up louder somewhere about an octave above that. So there's the fundamental. And here's, there it is. You see it coming out as I drag down. Now we're an octave higher. See all that up there between 100 and 200? Now I'm thinking about my waterfall effect here and how I want that to look similar to what we were looking at before in our reference tracks, right? And we see in our reference tracks. So if I went really high on the overtone track there, now I'm unbalanced, right? My bass is lower, my bass is lower than that mid to low. So I'm gonna come in there and shoot for that same kind of waterfall range there. You see that? It's perfect. And when I bring in the other instruments now, you'll see that we have a much smaller hole there. So I solved that one by adding overtones in the bass. Let's say I don't like that though. I don't like that bass sound and I want to fill it in another way. What I could do now is add sub frequencies to my accompaniment. And I'm going to just use the pluck sound that I have going there. So my frequencies in my pluck sound are up between 200 and 400. If I add a sub frequency to it, I move that down an octave and you can see it pop in right away, right? Let me turn that back off. Okay. It added some darker sounds down below. And now if I solo all those tracks, you'll see that I filled in that space too. I'm getting a smoother frequency response here, right? We've now filled that gap in two different ways. We've added an overtone onto the bass and we've added a sub onto the pluck. Another way to address the issue would be changing the pitches, right? And what I could do, let's say, maybe I'll come into my pluck track here. I might grab my pluck instruments and I could move them, I could move them down an octave. Let's see what happens. So now you'll see that I have much more spread between my bass accompaniment and lead. and the lead is way over the top there. So that's a third way I could solve that problem of having frequency gaps in, the, in my sound. So now that I've looked at ways of solving my frequency issue that I, by moving my pluck an octave lower, I wanted to take a look at some of the high frequencies. And this song is showing as pretty bright, especially like, That lead instrument, you can see it really popping out there. Not dropping off at a normal rate. Now, when I look at my reference at the Calvin Harris, there is a lot of high frequency information there, but that's because of the snare and the hi-hat. And if I have that much high frequency information in my lead instrument, I know it's going to be too harsh at the top. So I have a couple options I wanted to look at with that, and I'll just show you some of the things I tried to do. I went into the lead instrument and I thought, well, can I synthesize that off? If I solo my lead right now, maybe I could put a steeper filter on it. Turn the, the high frequencies down. The problem is every, to get that kind of bright sound I want, it's too harsh on the top. I can't get the overtones on it that I want without it sounding harsh. And the main reason for that is I look at it, and I touched on this earlier, is that I'm way high right here. I'm up at C5, and that's just a, it's a harsh range. If you're gonna be up at C5, you're gonna to start to get into whistle and bell sounds because you don't wanna have a whole lot of the overtones. They're gonna to be too harsh. So what I decided I have to do is, rather than filter it off and make it a darker sound, that I was gonna to need to change the octave of these notes. So what I did, I went in and I took the, these notes and I moved them down an octave. So now when I play it, I'm getting a much more reasonable response there from six, eight, and 10 kilohertz. Look what happens if I go back up the octave. See all those overtones? I'm, by moving it down an octave, I, I'm taking what was at 10 and I'm moving it all the way down to five because remember an octave is a doubling of the frequency. So I'm significantly bringing this high frequency energy down while maintaining some of the fundamental relationships between the overtones and the fundamental frequency that I liked in that sound, the, the timbre of that sound, if you will, right? But putting music together is 
like putting a puzzle together. And what happened when I moved that lead sound down is now I'm causing some conflict and some masking with my accompaniment sound. Okay, so I've moved it down an octave, but now we have a, a large buildup of frequencies in these mid-range areas that are masking each other. And what I maybe would have done in the past, if I didn't have a choice, would, would be to come in here and carve out a little space in the accompaniment track for the lead. And you can hear that when I do that, you can hear the lead more, right? But the problem is that my accompaniment is starting to sound weird and unnatural, okay? Hyper EQing, this sort of thing is going to be a very unnatural sound. You want to avoid this if you can. You're going to see all sorts of people doing it, and I'm saying don't. Because what we want to do instead is we're going to create a space for those notes using composition. We're going to go back and compose it, right? So we can see that the top two voices in the accompaniment part are interfering with the lead. So let's go ahead and move those top two voices up an octave. I'm going to grab them just like this, move them up an octave, and probably these guys here. Let's see. And now when I bring my lead part back in, I can see that I've created a space in there. The fundamental frequencies are in different ranges, so they're not interfering with each other. I've got a little problem right here. I can see I've got a second between those two notes, and that's not going to sound good. So I probably have to move that one down an octave. And we'll see how that sounds. Part of the issue there is that my lead is really coming up high, so it's making my accompaniment maybe have to come down low to be contrapuntal to it. So now if I listen to that... I've got all that space for my lead without EQing it. I can look at just the pad. And you can see the lower note there. And you can see the higher notes here and that hole right here where I know my lead part is, right? Here's my lead. At this point, mixing and composition are the same thing, right? We're moving notes around to change the frequency response. My plucks now, I put the octave below and they should sound pretty good under that pad. Yeah, they're not masking each other at all. And I can bring the lead back in and I have a lot more room now. Notice how you can hear all four sounds, right? You got two accompanying parts, lead and bass, and you can hear them all clearly. And there's a fairly consistent falling off of the frequency here now. The lead isn't overpowering in the high frequencies and not blasting out at 10k. And the next thing I'm looking at and I can hear, but I'm also seeing, is that I have gaps down here in my low frequencies, right? And part of that is that we put in a very narrow bandwidth bass sound. When you put in that 808 bass sound, it's just one frequency, which is cool sometimes. But again, if you've got a, if you've got a system that can't produce that frequency, or if you have a system that's really good and can produce some lower frequencies, you want to take advantage of it. So what I did on my bass is I went in and I actually added some of that overtone we talked about earlier to fill in the gap here. And you can see I just filled it in right there by adding some of that. But then I also want some low frequencies below. So I'm going to add in another oscillator and I'm going to I'll put triangle. I could have put sine either one. And what I'm going to do is going to drop that oscillator an octave below and watch what happens when that comes in. You'll see some of those bass frequencies come in there. But see it down there? It's really low, right? Now, if I do that, I got a big hole right here. And it, these sound disjunct from each other. So I want to bring them together. So I'm going to bring in a little bit of that most important bass range, which is 60 to 100 hertz a little bit of the low and a little bit of the high octaves. And if I solo the bass, you can see what I'm doing here. So this is just the fundamental frequency. And this is just the sub down there. You see that? So I'm mixing my song, my low frequency, my bass, by moving this triangle around, not by EQing. Does that make sense? If you look over at a reference track, there's a good example here. Most basses will roll off. Once you get below 40, it's going to start to roll off. You don't want to have a bunch of information down below 30 hertz. It just, just can't be reproduced by most speakers. And so what I'm mimicking is that same kind of arc here, and then the, the, the kind of gradual falling off in my bass. Okay, so I've added 
overtones in my bass, and now when I bring in the rest of my instruments, you can see I'm getting a much smoother drop here. Now, I wish everyone could afford to go out and get this product, which is called Isotope Tonal Balance Control, and um, it does a much better job of representing this information than a typical spectrum analyzer. And you can really see in here the balance between low, mid, and high in our song. I'm actually a little bass heavy here. You see that? It has a little bass heavy there. And I can control that pretty much by just turning up and down the bass at this point, right? And you can hear all four parts of my song very clearly, right? Lead, accompaniment, pluck, accompaniment, pad, and the bass, okay? And then the drums kind of will overlay with those. So the, the drums have a similar frequency response. If we go look at that, We know that kick usually wants to be in the 60 to 80 hertz range and the fundamental frequency of the snare is usually in the 2 to 300. A lot of hip hop, sometimes it'll come up to 300. Traditionally, it's more around 200. Since I was doing kind of this slow, I don't know, 80s ballad sort of song with this, I had more at around 200. Now I'm look, looking at that kick in the snare and I'm feeling like it's a little thin. It sounds a little artificial. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add some frequencies to the kick, just like I did to the bass. And one of the places I could do that is inside the synthesizer itself. Okay, I could add other oscillators. But the thing is I've used up most of my oscillators already. Okay, I've already got the sine level and I don't have any other oscillators in the synthesizer. One of the uh, really nice tools that I use a lot is called a sub enhancer. Logic, it is here, it's called sub bass. And what this is gonna do is synthesize new frequencies on top of that existing frequency. I could have done that with the bass too, but in the bass, I still have those extra oscillators to work with. In this kick drum, I don't. So I wanna create some new wave forms over it. Now, I'm not sure what other applications have something like this. If I don't know if Live does or other ones but it's called an enhancer or a sub bass enhancer, and it's gonna add additional frequencies to it. This can add two frequencies. If I look at my kick now, I see that it's very centered around there, and I'm gonna kinda of want some of the same thing that I had in the bass. I want a little extra oomph down below here and a little bit more woody sound up above. Again, that's so you can hear that bass sound when you're on a smaller speaker system. And then also it'll give it some additional punch. People talk about punch all the time, but one of the places that you get a lot of punch is in this 100 to 200. It can turn into a mud if you're not careful. In this one, if you set the ratio to one, you set the frequency you want it to be at. So we'll say about 130. And then I'll just leave the bandwidth where it is. I'm going to bring in this wet and you're gonna, you should see some additional frequency being added. In fact, if I take the dry down and just do wet. This thing is synthesizing an additional sine wave over the top and mixing it with my initial kick. That makes sense? So again, I'm not EQing, I'm synthesizing, right? I'm adding a new frequency. And then what I also did at this one is I did the same thing down below. I said, uh, put it at 40 Hertz. And let's add some of that. Now it's kind of a weird interface here. You gotta drag it down this way. Hopefully you can hear that. You can also see it here if I do just, just the wet there, right? And that's down to 40 hertz, right? And that Now 40 hertz is too low. I mean, that's what you hear when you're in the next room, but it's not what makes you move, right? So we want that, that 60 to 80, but some of the 40 and some of the woody sound up on top. And then I can take the ratio of it. So I'm looking kind of for that smooth arc in here and well, I'm listening for it too. You'll, you'll hear these things more as you work with it, right? Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take and listen to that kick and the bass together and see how they're sounding. And they're working pretty well together. This isn't something you could additionally have done with a drum set. You would have had to do all this when you set the microphone and pick the drum head and picked what you were putting on the the skin to mute the drum. But now even plugins will allow you to do this. There's a lot of plugins like the JJP drum plugins in Waves where it has a sub enhancer built right into it. Now let's talk about compression a little bit. Compression is a very complicated tool to learn how to use right. It has taken me many years to understand it and I'm still learning a lot about it. When you are working with these sounds, these programmed sounds, you don't need compression to serve its original purpose, which was 
to control wide dynamic range in a record. An acoustic bass or acoustic guitar or piano have massive dynamic ranges that you have to be able to control. But here, that especially that sub bass or the pluck or the pad or the lead, they pretty much play at the same level every single note. The one place you probably are going to want to do some compression is on your percussion sounds. Why don't we start with the kick? And the kick is tricky to get right because you want to feel that kick in your chest, but you don't want it to be too woofy. You want it to be under control. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and put a compressor on here. And I use the Logic compressor. I like it a lot. And I'm, I'm always using the Studio Fet, uh, which is, I think, a remake of the 1176. Why do I use this one? Because I like the interface. I like the black. And I can hear it. When I move these knobs around, I can really hear this compressor. It's one thing to do is if you get to a compressor and you start moving things around and it's not immediately clear to you what, what it's doing, it might not be the compressor for you. What I'm going to do now is just talk a little bit about this kick. And I'm going to play it with it bypassed. Okay. And what I can feel is that little, that push of the air, and it's a little too woofy for me. I want to be able to uh, control that just a little bit, keep that kick from, from pumping so much at the bottom end. And so I'm just going to add a, a basic compression here. I'm going to set the level so it's got some, you know, 0 to 10 dB of reduction. Uh, well, sure, we'll put somewhere between uh, my ratio between two and five decibels. And then I'm going to go over and start looking at this attack and release because this is where the sound is really going to change. So if I put a, a fast attack and a slow release on here, you, I'm hoping you can hear it just sucked the kick right out of the song. In fact, all it's doing is turning down the volume because it's never coming all the way back up to zero. Does that make sense? Now, if I left it like that, I would be turning down the kick. And if I made the attack slower, You'll hear that some of the beginning part of the kick drum will get through. It'll sound like a click. Hear the click? Let me turn up the ratio just a little bit more to make sure people can hear it. Okay, if I turn it all the way down, nothing. Click. That click is a good thing because that is the sound of the attack. That's the sound of the drum right when the beater would have hit the head, even though this is a fake drum. But we can't have too much of it, okay? If you have too much of it, then eventually it just sounds like a click, right? You don't have any power behind the kick. So what we'd want to do is reduce the amount of reduction on this. And I would do that probably most by reducing the ratio. My ratio is barely at 1.2 to 1 right now, and I can hear that click come in without... That's with it off. So this release, because it's so slow, is raining in the woomph, and the attack is letting just enough of the click through that you can hear it and you have some attack on the front of your drum, okay? It's a balance. You, we, we, you will probably be coming back into your mix numerous times and adjusting these three knobs, okay? You might, might adjust their threshold. I set it a little low there. But this attack, this rate release, and this ratio are going to be really important. And you, what you'll hear is the attack will generally be the high frequency. It'll be the first click sound of the kick hitting. If you want to hear more of it, you turn the attack to a slower time. If you want to hear less of it, you shut it, you turn it down to a very short time. If you want to hear more of the bass sound of the kick drum, the low frequencies, you turn the release shorter. If you make the release longer, you're turning down the volume of the low frequencies. So this is almost like an equalizer, right? High frequencies here, low frequencies here, and the amount of the change here. So let me just go th play through that again, and uh, I'll talk through what I'm hearing. Okay, if I turn this attack down, you can or the, the release down, you can hear more of the woomph come back in. Hear it? If I turn it way the other way, less woomph. So I'm trying to find a balance between boom, boom, and click, click. Which I'm kind of hearing right there. And I'm probably going to end up somewhere in that range right there. 
So I'm kind of like that. I have a pretty low ratio right there. This the the response of this equalizer changes as you change the ratio, and I've been really into kind of low ratios, and just the way it sounds right now. I'm liking it. So again, finding that balance between click and woomph here, and using attack, release, and ratio to determine that. Let me turn it off. That's what it sounded like. I'm hoping you can hear kind of that woody woomph woomph sound there. That is the main thing. I'm trying to control with this. Let me turn it back off again. And back on. More control over it, okay? That's really important. Um, let me go ahead and do the same thing on the snare here. Let's take a look at what we got snare-wise. Okay, so snare, same idea, right? This is gonna control the amount of the fundamental frequency that we hear. This is gonna hear the control the amount of the overtones, the noise that we hear when it's smacked, okay? And this is gonna control how much of it we're turning up and down. So let's go ahead and just put way too much compression on this for a second. No attack, do you hear that? Okay, so let me go ahead and allow some attack through now. There we go, and you can hear that smack right at the beginning, right? I, when I'm completing my mix, I'm coming in, I'm adjusting this thing by half a millisecond at the end to make the snare pop in and out of the mix. If I bring this to a higher millisecond, that snare will come forward in the mix. If I move it down to a shorter millisecond, the snare will move backwards in the mix. I've got way too much uh, uh, compression on, so I'm going to turn that down. Trying to listen to just the the front end out of it, the attack. Mm, right there. Now, it, I hope you can hear right about there, I start letting in more of the mid to low frequency. Okay. Okay, hear the do, do. When I shorten this, it goes away. Okay, so this is letting more of those low frequencies through as I move this up and eventually lets them all through, right? Okay. And then what I'm gonna do is now this will, if I if I shorten the release time, you'll hear more of the low fundamental frequency coming through. Hear that? Okay. When I go back to Mimi Mix, I'm gonna control the amount of attack and the amount of release within the mix, right? Once I've found kind of my ranges that I like. Okay, so I'll probably end up somewhere right in that range. You see how little I'm actually putting on. That's because it's not a real drummer. I don't need to have a ton of control over this snare because every single snare beat is going to be the same. Every single kick beat is going to be the same. So I'm using the compressor not for control, but for noise shaping and for mixing. Now I'm listening to the relationship between the two. I just want them to kind of have a similar feel, right? Let's see if I can move that snare forward and back for you. So watch what happens when I shorten the attack on that snare all the way. Here I just went away. The snare is way in the background. I could turn it up. That snare is further away. Now watch what happens when I open it up. All right, that snare is more in your face now, right? If I want more of the body of the snare, I turn this down. Hear that? A lot more body. Now, just more attack. It is equalization at this point. This is my high frequency control, this is my low frequency control, and this is the amount of it. I'm reshaping the envelope that has an effect on the frequency. Hi-hat, I might do something, something similar. Let's just take a quick listen to the hi-hat. Okay, and if I shorten the attack way down and lengthen the release, you can hear that I've just turned the volume down. So let me lengthen the attack again. And you can see I kind of do this each time, right? Right here, I start to hear the click on the hi-hat. And right here, I start to hear what would normally be the stick sound. It's a synthesized version of the stick. And then right about here, I start to not have any effect from it. I, want, I don't want it to be pure click, I wanted to have a little bit of a, like, say it's a drumstick hitting an actual hi-hat. And then watch what happens as I turn the compress or the release time down. 
more of the noise sound comes through, right? The sustain sound. Okay. So I'm listening for a balance of that attack and that sustain sound. I'm controlling them here. Okay. And now. I'm So let me see if I can mute all three of these, see if we can hear the difference. Off. I might actually turn that kick down a little bit. The, the kick needs a little bit more control over it. They are off again. Back on. So I've asserted some control over my kick and snare and hi-hat sounds. I'm shaping them and synthesizing them, if you will, using a compressor a little bit. I could do something similar in my lead sound. Let's see what compressor sounds like on my lead. Let me just go through the same process. Long attack, a short attack, long release. Turning the volume down. This is a pretty attacky lead already, right? It's got dun, 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 dun. I don't know that I want it to be more attacky. Let's see. In fact, I might want it to be less. You see how much softer that is? So if I turn the... I actually like that in a lot of ways but I want a little bit of attack so let me bring it in right about here you start to hear it that pulls the sound forward right what I'm listening for when I'm moving that knob is where is that lead sound forward and back with the music is it popping out in the front or is it going in the back i don't want it to pop out too much i don't want it to be it's already an annoying sound but i don't want it to disappear in the back because i want it to be the lead i'm that's what i'm listening to when I'm, I'm moving this shortening this moves it further behind the instruments lengthening it brings it up front it's got a punch right on the front end somewhere in the middle i'm hearing it kind of balance with the other instruments got to turn that crash down that was too much Now, how loud do I want the sustain part to be? Hear how much that turns up the volume of the sustain sound in the lead, right? When I bring this release down, suddenly it gets louder. The front end isn't louder, but the sustain sound. Versus. about a 10 millisecond attack and about a 200 millisecond release which is kind of a range of a lot of compressors actually and then i'm going to adjust the ratio to decide how much of it i want that would be none that's it for my lead let me take a quick look at my pluck that might be another one that i might put some compression on because it is basically a percussion instrument and i'm just going to go ahead and turn the ratio up attack down release up Threshold down. I hit play. This is uh, with the compression, without it. Interestingly, not much of a difference, right? I don't hear, I can't even hear it myself. Uh, let's see what happens though if I start to let some of the attack through. You can hear it right there, right? Right again, about 10 milliseconds. So 10 milliseconds, I start to hear the initial attack. 20 milliseconds, I'm hearing the mid-range. And by the time I get to 50 milliseconds, I'm hit, hearing the fundamental frequency kicking in. With mid-range and that low fundamental frequency. Anything above that, I'm not hearing. There's not much more going on in the attack, okay? This is a low mid sound that is very punchy. It's almost a percussion instrument. So what I'm going to determine how much woody sound I want this to bring into my mix. I'm going to determine that in the mix by 
adjusting the attack and release. So I'm going to set that attack about where I started to hear, hear it clearly, right? Right there. Somewhere in there. Now you can hear the sustain, right? I can really bring up the sustain by turning down the release. Right? So right in there is about where I like the sustain level. I'm going to just turn the uh, ratio down. And here it is with and without. With. Without. I've been able to maintain the fundamental quality of the sound, but give it just a little bit more, I hate to use the word punch, but uh, that's the word that everyone, everyone uses. But I'm doing that by adjusting the relationship between the attack and the release. So now my song is sounding like this. You can, you can hear the lead now, much more mellow, right? I might have to, let it pop through a little bit more there. I'm listening now to the pat, the pluck. Not too bad over there. It's on the left and right. That's too much, right? There's too much pluck there. Uh, if I go to the bass, I'm not sure that I need any compression on the bass. Let's see here. Such a sustained sound. Let's see what happens. Hear the difference? Cutting out some of the overtones when I bring the the release up because some of those sustained frequencies we added I don't know if you remember earlier we added some of those frequencies that definitely kills the attack right so now as I go back to my mix I probably wouldn't put quite that much uh, compression on well, maybe I kind of like it I can control now the amount of bass by just changing the release here. Watch. If I turn it down, we'll get more bass. Hear it? I need I need more attack time on that bass there. So I'm listening again to the front end of the sound and the sustain level of sound. I'm trying to find a ratio that I like that has some attack to it and then also some sustain to it. What do I like in the song? This allows me to turn those up and down. So almost think of these as volume knobs. For my pad sound, I wouldn't put compression on this, but I will. Just for this example, if I turn the attack down, release up. If I shorten and lengthen the attack now, you can hear the note changes. And that'll control the overall volume of the sustain level, which this sound is almost all sustain, right? So this is an important knob right here, right? I'm ending up in about the same place. So now if I take a look at my overall track, I can compare it to some of our reference tracks. So I've still got this tonal balance control here. We've got our reference, and now I'm gonna go look at the EQ on the master track. Let's compare it to your reference. And you can see that these are similar, right? I've got a little bit of, inf a lot of information right here in the mid, the mid range, but for the most part, I'm mimicking some of the fall off. I probably could bring the bass up a little bit, so I'm going to go ahead and just, what I can do is shift click on the um, 
bass and the kick. I like the relationship between the two of them. i just bring that up. You can see my snare has a lot of high frequency in it, right? But uh, so does theirs. I've still got some gaps there, and you can see that the reference track doesn't have as many of those gaps, right? When we get back to tweaking and mastering and all that stuff, we'll go into more details in that. So well, we've gone through EQ, which basically I went through and recomposed the song, resynthesized things. I've gone through compression and ended up doing pretty much the same thing to all the tracks, which is kind of funny. Those weren't the settings that I ended up when I mixed this separately, but uh, I like the way they're sounding here. Let's look at delay first, and we'll do one of the cheesy, typical EDM things that I always like, and that is to put some delay on a percussive instrument so that you hear the echoes happening. We already have some delay built in in our track here. If we come into the Serum Synthesizer, built into Serum is a, an effects rack, and why don't I... I'll just use that since I happen to really like the way the reverb and delay work in this effects rack. This is a delay of a quarter note, and ping pong means it's going to go from left to right to left to right. So I can just turn that on, and I can control the feedback right here. And I can control how bright it is here, right? So I'm just going to listen to my track and how much of it I want here. So the four main qualities of a delay-based effect are how much of it, the wet-dry mix, the time, how much is each echo, the feedback, how many echoes do you have, and then the color, how bright or dark is it. You're going to have that in pretty much every delay effect. I want more feedback, more of the effect, darker, slower, okay. so I'm going to go back to that quarter, I'm going to probably, probably go back to about where I was, obviously I had ended up there before, right? Hear the difference when I uh, take the low frequency out of the echo? Makes it less muddy, right? There's less masking going on. The other effect I'm going to add to that is a little bit of reverb. Reverb will just allow it to sit in space. It will make it sound less cheesy, less like a synthesizer. Reverb is incredibly complex to learn. The most important thing on reverb is to not overdo it. Most people will tend to overdo it, and there's a lot of subliminal information coming in reverb, especially in the early reflections that will inform your ear. In fact, if the reverb's done right, you almost don't hear it. It's just the pluck suddenly sounds better. Okay, let's see. Or more natural, I'd say. Hear that? That's all it needs right there. Add in the echo. If I crank this all the way, you'll hear a ton of reverb, right? That's distracting to the song. At that point, the reverb is the sound, not the pluck, right? I want to have control over that relationship. If I want that pluck sound, I can't overdo it with reverb, right? Reverb has some of the same controls as a delay-based effect. You have the amount of it, the mix. You have how long it will last. And then you will usually have some sort of color. So do you want it light or dark, right? And you can control the light or dark here. I happen to like the out-of-the-box sound that... Someone listening to the song would never hear that reverb. They'd hear that echo. I mean, I'm using the, or the delay. I'm using that as a pretty clear effect. But that reverberation is just enough that it sounds like it's in space. If I go to my lead sound now, first of all, you can hear the echo, right? Or the delay. It's actually almost the same setting as I had on the plucks, right? I might actually darken it a little bit. Kind of like that right there, right? Yeah. And then in the reverberation, I've picked a different type of reverb. I've picked a plate reverb. Now, the reason I picked a plate reverb is plate reverb has a lot more, shall I say, attack in it. 
meaning that you start to hear the reverberation sound more up front. And I wanted to push that reverb sound with the lead instrument so it was like right there. Okay, so let's see if uh, I'm gonna just switch between plate and hall here. I don't know, to me, I can hear the hall and it's almost like an echo. It's like a separate space. When I click on the plate, that lead sound sounds more like it's far away, right? In the plate itself, okay? And this is, it has to do with how those reverberations die off over time. We'll get that into that more in the next class. So I picked the plate one for this, and then I just controlled the size and the mix. Way too much size there, right? There we go, and maybe a little bit of... My pluck and my lead, I ended up putting kind of similar sounds on them. Let's see how they... Now I'm going to go back and I'm going to adjust those, right? But I need to adjust them with all the music going eventually, right? Do I really want to hear that echo now? What I'm trying to do there is hear those echoes happening between the phrases, but have them die out by the time the next phrase starts. You know what I'm going to do for the drums? I'm going to go ahead and start with the snare, and I'm just going to put a, a reverberation on the snare. I'm going to use the Logic's built-in reverb. And again, reverb is going to have, you know, three or four basic controls. It's going to have the wet dry mix. It's going to have how long the reverb is. And it's going to have how bright it is, which in this one you use an e yeah, there's actually a built in equalizer right in it. Let's go ahead and hit play on the snare. Now, part of the reason I use this reverb a lot every time I put it on, I'm like, oh, that sounds pretty close to me. In fact, if I just adjusted that wet mix on that. It sounds a little long to me. I'm going to uh, try to shorten it. And bring up the level. That's about all I would do for right now. I'm just controlling how long the reverb lasts and how much of it there is. I could make it a little darker or brighter. Let's see if I... I do like it a little brighter, so I'm taking out some of the low frequency in it. Makes it sound... You know, in the 80s, they had a lot of really heavy low drums. Now I might want to put some of that same reverb on the hi-hat and the cymbals, so I can just option drag that over from this. And maybe I turn down the amount of it. And let my ear go between these different sounds to hear where they are in space. Like the pluck now I'm hearing, feels like it, it could have more reverb on it. But I'll be careful though, because I know I'm going to play it on its own at some point.
Reverb's just a little bright, too. I'm going to also bring down some of the high. Maybe just put a uh, filter on it. What tends to happen is you tend to hear things that sound too loud to you and you turn them down. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to come back to my drums and my instrument buses, and I'm just going to bring them up until the drums are back at zero. Uh, which I can't even do. This problem will happen to all of you at some point. So now what I need to do is I need to go into each track and I can click and drag across them in Logic here. And I can click and drag across the tracks here. And I'm going to bring them all up until my drums are at zero here. I'm pretty close to having a mix that I'm happy with for this class. Let's go over and take a look now at the main out on this track. If I hit play. You'll hear that when I get these so that the drums are right about zero, that it goes over by about three decibels. And that's about what we want. And what we're going to do is we're going to put a limiter on there. Okay, I'm going to put in this limiter. If I go into dynamics, limiter, the output level will never go above zero decibels. Okay. Now, when I hit play, you'll see that it reduced the sound by about 3.6 decibels in order to keep it at zero here, right? Zero at the output. If you have much more reduction than that, say by doing this, I have 11 decibels of reduction right there, and I hope you can hear it. It's very crushed. The sound is very crushed, okay? You want to have no more than four decibels of reduction on your master limiter that you've put in, okay? Right about there is just about perfect. That's where I'd like you to be. Now, we're going to talk about more of the mastering things in later classes in this program. But I'm hoping that this video has helped you get through these first couple steps and showing you how I actually do it in the real world.